G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Where's My Yowie. Today, I'm reading an old newspaper report about the capture of a Thunderbird near Ararat, Victoria, in the early 1700s, possibly even earlier. So we'll get into it. This was published in Sydney's Evening News on Saturday, the 10th of September, 1898 titled The Bunyip of Chalicum. Probably no race of men have held possession of a country for ages and yet left so few traces of their existence behind as the Aborigines of Australia. Egypt has her pyramids, her temples, palaces as large as towns, her yet more wonderful tombs, those sub subterranean labyrinths of painted chambers rivaling the gorgeous creations of the Arabian Nights. Jerusalem yet retains two or three immense stones, part of her ancient city wall, a relic to which the Jews still annually resort to weep over their fallen fortunes. Rome has left memorials of her rule from Scotland to the Seine, on the borders of the tropics, from Spain to the heart of Arabia. Etruria has bequeathed her sepulchres with their graceful vases and the armour of her warriors. Nivenve has the huge and mysterious mound, out of which a stranger from the west, the adventurous Layard, has recently disinterred those colossal statues and inscriptions and, in and ornaments which for thousands of years have been mouldering in silence and solitude. The Norsemen have left us their tombs and their armour. Even our savage and painted forefathers, the Britons, have left a palpable footprint of their existence behind. Witness Stonehenge with its giant blocks and the immense Loggen Stone, nicely poised and still to be moved by a single hand as it hangs over the surf-beaten rocks at Land's End. But the Australian natives, what trace of their existence will they leave behind when swept from the list of nations? We know nothing besides than the pictures rude and unintelligible discovered by Captain Gray in some caves in Western Australia, the camp ovens where in happier times they roasted the kangaroo hole and the object of the present article, the bunyip of Chalicum. The bunyip, it is well known, is a mysterious monster of undefined size and shape, supposed by the Aborigines to inhabit the deep pools of the Australian rivers. Whether we view the report as founded upon the real existence of some unknown animal, or a pure creation of Australian fancy, a delineation of the bunyip by a native hand cannot but be considered an object of interest. Such a delineation, with a legend attached to it, still exists. Cut out on the turf near the Fiery Creek, not many miles from the southern base of the Pyrenees, about six and a half miles from the station of Messrs Cooper and Thompson, for which they have retained the native name of Chalicum. The locality is not unsuited to the tradition. A vast, treeless, shrubless, trapeze plain, out of which the rock here and there protrudes. A little stream, stealing through the long grass on its banks, and here expanding into three large, deep water holes. A small thicket of scrubby and grotesque gum trees hanging over one of the pools and breaking the monotony of the sea, the hazy purple of the distant belt of mountains on the horizon. Such are the chief features of this lonely and dreary scene. No living thing is visible unless the eagle hawk be seen sailing along overhead in quest for prey. The tradition, though very generally known to the natives, is exceedingly meagre in its details. One of these water holes was, it says, inhabited by a bunyip, who one day got a hold of and devoured an Aboriginal man. 
The Aborigines, on seeing this, speared the bunyip and dragged him out of the water hole. As he lay on the grass beside the pool, they marked an outline of his form on the turf and afterwards removed the soil within this outline, leaving a figure of the monster in Intaglio on the ground. Such is the tradition, and we have preferred giving it its native simplicity to dressing it up with ornaments and incidents unknown to the natives themselves. As to the period when the event happened, nothing more can be learnt from the Aborigines than that it was a long time ago, a phrase which they repeat and reiterate with that peculiar musical cadence which must be familiar to all accustomed to communicate with them. They seem to have no chronology more accurately marked than phrases such as this. The space where the turf was removed is now partially overgrown and the feet and extremities of the figure cannot be made out with much difficulty. It will, however, be seen from a glance at the sketch that it bears more likeness to a bird of the ostrich or emu family than to a reptile. Its dimensions are colossal. It measures about 12 feet from head to tail. It should be added that the natives maintain that many bunyips still exist in large waterholes so that we are not allowed the hypothesis of an extinct species. Nor does the monster appear to have anything in common with the huge amphibious saurians of the pre-Adamite world. We remember only one instance of a somewhat similar method of commemorating an event. The scene of this was the far-famed island of Inona in the Hebrides. For centuries, the bright point from whence the light of Christianity and civilization shone forth upon the surrounding nations of the north, the founder of, a, of the religious establishments of the island, a certain Irish saint, whose name we forget and whose story is probably to, found, to be found in no library this side of the equator, sailing from Ireland, landed with his followers in a little sheltered bay at the western extremity of the island. In memory of the event, the islanders raised a mound of pebbles on the shore of the bay of the exact size and form of the vessel in which the missionaries had landed. The mound is still in existence and shown to the stranger, and the tradition attached to it yet casts its feeble flicker through the night of ages to the early period of conflict between paganism and the cross. As to the story of the Bunyip of Chalicum, even though we should consider it a mere fiction, it may still be viewed with interest as perhaps the single extant memorial of Aboriginal mythology. The only analogue in Australia, so sterile of romance, to the beautiful myths of Greece, to the gorgeous imaginings of Oriental fancy, to the fantastic creations of our own fairyland of the North. From an old book purchased at sale. The end. Oh, this is really interesting, this. So, they've, um, a guy's gotten um, eaten by the um, bunyip, and um, so they've killed it and they pulled it out of the water, of the Aborigines, and then they've made an outline of it with tomahawks in the dirt and then dug that out so it's it's uh, got a, um, not a mound, but dug out form of the bird. And um, it was obviously a large emu type bird and we had an extinct um, species of uh, thunderbird um, known as Dromornis uh, Stutoni. And uh, that, that grew to like uh, three metres tall and weighed 600 gra uh, kilos. Um, and what the pity about this story was, the cutting that the Aborigines made, it was maintained for years and years and years, and was still there in the late 1860s, and they still like, used to maintain it and cut it out all the time to keep it shown. And then white settlers came in and drove the Aborigines out, and they fenced the area off, and the grass grew really long, and it made it really hard to make the cutting out, but you sort of can still make it out. And then later another farmer came along and he removed the fence and he let sheep graze there and their hooves destroyed the last remaining trace of the cattle, 
uh, the cutting, and now it's uh, lost forever, which is a real pity. Okay, that's it from me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.